back to the second session, um, everyone. And um, this session is entitled The Relationship Between Health and Social Science Research and How to Bridge the Gap. And we have two speakers for the session um, whom I will introduce, which is Professor Renal Berger and Dr. Graham Hodenot. And so in that order, um, let me introduce our speakers. So um, Professor Berger, um, her research examines health inequalities in African countries, and she serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Development Studies, and she's an associate editor of Health Economics and Development South Africa. She's a research fellow at the Partnership for Economic Policy at Laval University and the Center for Research in Economic Development and International Trade at Nottingham University. Her work has been published in many high impact uh, journals, um, specifically on development and, and health journals, um, such as the Lancet Global Health, Economic Development and Cultural Change and World Development. So welcome to you, Professor Renal Berger, whom I will hand over to in a minute. And our second speaker is Dr. Graham Hodinot. Welcome, Graham. Um, Graham has over 17 years experience working in communities with um, of highest TB and HIV comorbidity in South Africa. A lot of his work has focused on the health services access, uptake and sustained care for children, adolescents and young adults. And since 2012, he's been responsible for the social behavioral science portfolio at the Desmond Tutu TB Center um, and the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health at Stellenbosch. His research expertise um, is around bridging between public and social behavioral science and is focused on understanding the structural system, systemic and operational processes underpinning public health interventions in high burden contexts. He holds an African Academy of Sciences Fellowship on improving TB services for adolescents and young adults. So welcome to our two speakers and I'll hand over to the first speaker, which I think is Prof. Renal Berger. And just then a reminder in terms of the, of the housekeeping, we'll keep microphones and video cameras inactive during the webinar and we will facilitate a Q&A, or I will facilitate the Q&A session um, at the end. And to our speakers, there might be a, a brief interruption during your presentations just to remind you um, when you have five minutes and, and two minutes left for your presentation. So if I could now hand over to our first speaker, uh, Professor Renal uh, Berger. We can see your slides. Okay, great. Can you also hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks, Prof. Okay, great. Um, so thank you a lot for inviting me. It was very interesting to hear the previous engagements in the sessions um, on um, race, and I hope that this will also um, stimulate as much conversa conversation and, and engagement um, as the previous sessions. Um, so I was invited to share our experiences as a team who works on the border of social science and um, health often with multidisciplinary teams and often um, also engaged with policymakers. And I think the work is interesting and relevant as a window on some of the complexities of the decisions that the ethical uh, boards and the committees have to make because um, you know, often we deal with, with issues around these borders and how to navigate these borders. As a window onto some of the problems that we experience and some of the complexities that we encounter, um, I will talk about a very specific project that we had, and that was um, the mystery patient study um, in 2016. Now, just to introduce the concept, because I, I'm very aware that not all of you might be um, familiar with um, this concept. Uh, mystery patients, sometimes also called standardized patients or simulated patients, are trained evaluators who are simulating typical patients um, seeking health advice or health care. Um, they are sent to health care facilities as COVID patients and they have very typical um, scripted opening sentences. It's all supposed to be very similar um, so that the variations in the responses and the questions that the health workers ask can then be comparable. Um, and ideally, for instance, um, you know, one of our standardized patients in our study um, 
started with the opening uh, statement that I've been coughing a lot uh, recently, and this was supposed to be a TB standardized patient, and then we expect that uh, those um, answers to the questions that are very standardized in the opening statement to, uh, to map to specific probes, diagnosis, and treatments, recommended next steps. And those are then the things that are documented um, once the standardized patients leave the facility and that um, we analyze as researchers. Um, yeah. And um, what is great is that um, we conducted the study after there's been substantial work by other researchers internationally, and they have, for instance, done wonderful work to show uh, when they compared um, the recorded um, versions of the interactions and what the standardized patients captured on the score sheets, that there was a very high degree of data accuracy. Um, although, despite the fact that it's recall dependent, the um, standardized, standardized patients would um, fill out the score sheets as shortly after the interaction as they could, but they did need to um, get a place of privacy. Um, so there's some sort of um, time lapse. So of course, <laughs> part of the challenge of this um, work when we when we started to be interested in it is that um, it is somewhat um, contentious. Um, it's seen as something that's ethically risky due to the concealment. We don't tell the health, the researchers don't tell the health workers that they're involved in research and they do not obtain the consent to participate in the research from the health workers. Um, however, um, based on the literature, um, it's been established that it's ethically justified in some cases where the benefits outweigh the cost and where it can be the argument can be made that no, there is no other way to obtain this information reliably. What is also useful and has been um, an interesting learning curve for us is also to understand to what extent one can limit concealment and in that way limit the risk. One can, for instance, inform um, the health system and the public health system where we conducted the work about the study on a high level without really risking, um, uh, risking the integrity of the study. Um, for instance, in our in, in our um, case, the health managers, the clinic managers um, of the entire province were informed that we were doing the study. Um, and then um, the other option in the literature is also that you can tell the health workers afterwards that they were part of a study and then um, ask them whether you can get permission to use the data. Um, Two other risks that are frequently cited are firstly labor relationships, um, you know, that it can um, lead uh, to problems when um, uh, health workers find out that there's been um, concealment and they might react um, to it. Um, it might also plausibly um, place the um, mystery patients at risk, but we in our study we have had a zero percent detection rate fortunately. None of the mystery patients were suspected or outed. Um, and then there are also sometimes arguments about um, this being a drain on resources, but I think that is the least worry, uh, the, the least uh, valid concern about it, because most studies um, have similar, if not greater, impact on Department of Health um, staff um, time investments. And this is just an extract from some of the literature that we engaged with beforehand. We um, spoke a lot to uh, Prof. Anton von Niekerk, and he also sat in, in some of the sessions we had with Lynn Horn. I see Lynn is on the call, and I think we stole our debt of gratitude to Lynn and also to Clarissa for taking the risk of allowing this work. And I'll talk a little bit about the outcome because I think um, we've learned a lot, and I hope that the Policymakers also learned a lot, and it's also really benefited the careers of some of the young researchers involved. So I do think it was a risk worth taking. Um, now about our study specifically, um, just to give some context, I'll talk about our study specifically, um, and then at the end I'll also share some reflections on the boundaries uh, between health researchers and social science researchers, and also um, the complexities of ethical processes, and that's more broadly, you know, based on my experience over the past 20 years. Um, uh, this study, um, 
This is the first time um, this approach was applied on this scale. There was a small scale study before on HIV care in Tswane. Um, and subsequently, after our study, there's been two other studies. Uh, the team that conducted this was mainly the Stellenbosch Economics Department, but also um, colleagues who were affiliated to our centre um, at um, UWC and Fort Hare. Both were PhD students at that time, um, but staff members at UWC and um, Fort Hare. And then Prof. Ulf Gertram from Lund University, Sweden, was also part of the team. He's one of the, <laughs> just to give some context, he's one of the, um, in terms of global citations, one of the top 20 um, health economists um, globally uh, since 1960, and a really prominent researcher. And um, we had strong policymaker participation, both in the Eastern Cape and the Western Cape. For instance, in the Western Cape, we had Anthony Hawkridge and also Hassan Mohammed and Bart Willems um, advising the study. It was um, largely NRA funded, and we were really doing this on a shoestring. Um, we covered 39 clinics, um, uh, and um, we had 12 mystery patients per facility. The mystery patients were trained on protocols. Uh, because they're trained on protocols, it's quite interesting because they have more information than the average um, patient and possibly also high expectations. We had four um, mystery patients per clinical area, and our clinical areas were hypertension, contraception, and TB. We used communi community members um, to ensure that their perspective on um, you know, what they see would be broadly representative of the average um, public sector um, patient from those communities. We covered quite a lot. We asked questions on symptoms, medical history, um, we captured, sorry, uh, whether the health worker asked questions about symptoms, medical history, family background, lifestyle, tests and examinations, what information the health worker shared, and then also waiting times. And we uh, had approximately 450 interactions that we gathered data on through these score sheets, so quite a lot of data. These are pictures of, of us um, training the health workers in the Western Cape above and below is the Eastern Cape team. Um, before I go into sort of the benefit side, which is really crucial to justify the concealment, I wanted to talk a little bit about why we wanted to mis do mystery patient work and how we ended up going along this route. Um, for us, it's really um, vital um, the, the, the client and the demand side of the health system. And specifically, we're very passionate about client responsiveness um, and using client responsiveness to really activate quality um, and promote quality, but quality in the fullest sense, um, you know, entailing sort of respect, acceptability, um, listening, um, taking account of, of the patient. Um, in the healthcare that that is provided and offered to to the to the client, um, so our concern was uh, doing this work to give a way to provide a voice to the community and to promote more more understanding. Um, and in a system where quality matters, we hope that um, you know, specifically uh, that metrics like these would help to promote uh, the prominence of the client's experiences and their voice. The difficulty with current um, client quality metrics is that um, often in the government system, clients may feel that they're disempowered and that affects the assessments. They don't have a full health knowledge. They don't always know the protocols, um, so they don't understand that if the protocols are not followed because they don't have knowledge of the protocols. But it's also um, problematic that um, uh, it, the health surveys and the household surveys make it clear that um, clients often have very low expectations, um, um, specifically in terms of waiting times and staff attitudes. They, uh, we see in the surveys that they might complain about waiting times and they might complain about staff members being rude to them, but then they will still um, in the satisfaction so that they're quite happy. And I think part of that comes from the disempowerment and also from uh, lowered expectations. Why not exit interviews? Why could we say that this um, this um, standardized patients or mystery patients offered something important that is over and above what exit interviews or 
um, file audits could give us. The difficulty with exit interviews, especially in a context like ours, is that there's substantial selection and who's willing to speak to a field, field worker. It's easily falsifiable on um, these interviews, and we've had instances of that in our work because we also did exit interviews so that we could compare what we found with the standardized patients with the exit interviews. Um, it is conducted close to the facility, um, so um, there are worries that um, the um, clients might feel that the health workers can overhear them. I think sometimes there are also concerns that they're not exactly sure who's conducting this work and that they might suspect that um, there will be feedback to the clinic. Then in general, there's also just social desirability bias. Um, and lastly, uh, one is also worried about the fact that you're only speaking to users, those who are actually going to the clinic and we're not getting a sense of those who are staying away and why they're staying away and not consulting um, healthcare workers. So it doesn't, it presents quite a biased picture. And in general, in the um, service that we've seen and that we've done, um, ratings are therefore uh, very, very high and much higher than we think that um, they should be. Um, why not patient file audits? That was, was the other contender for, for providing the same type of information. File audits can be useful, but I think it's important to note that it provides a provider perspective. It's the, what the nurses thought was important to note down. Also, Five it's minutes. very, it's very um, uh, reliant on what's written down. And what we found in the Eastern Cape, for instance, is that nurses' um, notes were incredibly cryptic. Um, and often only two lines of diagnosis were given um, versus the wealth of information that we captured with the score sheets. Um, I am only going to briefly show you one of the slides that we've um, uh, that captures some of the information that we got through the, the study. Um, you'll see here, um, this is for our TB standardized patients. In terms of HIV tests that at that stage should have been offered to all of the TB patients, um, standardized patients, because none of, none of them had HIV um, information on record, and you need an HIV test to properly evaluate um, the TB test because it varies based on HIV status, but only half of the standardized patients got offered HIV tests. Peter Barron was almost in tears when he saw this. And then also 20, only 28% of our standardized patients were reminded to collect their test results in two days' time, even though this is part of the protocol. I'm not going to go through the rest just to save time. What we learned from this is that it's definitely a feasible methodology. It's an important complementary tool to the existing toolkit. Um, our study confirmed that there were red flags about the reli reliability of exit interviews. And also more broadly, I think the standardized patient study was very interesting because it is a way to reconnect two worlds, the world of policy analysis, where we always want to add more things and be more careful, but which inadvertently then lengthens the protocols. For instance, in our training, we found it took 20 to 30 minutes to go through the TB protocols that were on paper. And in reality, these consultations were often five minutes. So in a way, we are preventing ourselves from making the hard choices about what to cover in those five minutes. And the academic outcomes were also very favorable. We established strong international networks and became part of the standardized patients working group, um, strong relationships with um, uh, Lund University and Ulf Gartner. Two PhD students graduated um, and we got full publications in highly visible journals. Um, I was invited to write a two-page commentary in the Lancet Global Health on whether it's feasible to use um, mystery patients to assess discrimination. And what was also great is that our study and our work was quoted um, by Jason Das, which is widely considered to be a leader in um, our field. Here are a few of the papers. And policy engagement was also very favorable. Um, and we presented the work to various different bodies and departments. Um, then in terms of my reflection, I hope I still have two or three minutes left for those. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Reflecting on my experiences collaborating with clinical colleagues. I mean, it, uh, all of this should be seen against the backdrop of intense gratitude for collaborations. Um, first point here is that there's a very big gap in the research budgets and the, um, and the size of the studies. Um, that often means that 
uh, clinical colleagues have great uh, slack in their budget to absorb and unanticipated delays. Um, they often have fewer PhD students and master's students. Um, we often have those students and that also further um, increases our sensitivity to unanticipated delays, like for instance, ethics or sort of uh, pro provincial um, permissions. Then I think the big difference for me also is the need to formalize and document um, uh, the study um, in its early stages. Um, often the clinical colleagues have very large teams, so it's vital that they need to document things, whereas um, sometimes in small studies that we're doing, it's not necessary to, to document everything because we're two people um, and our meeting notes is often enough to, to keep things in line and on track. The medical approach is also, I think it's important that to know that this is not always the only or the better way. Um, to be incredibly frank, I think in many instances, what I found and what was quite disappointing is that when there are differences in ways of doing things, clinical colleagues, not all of them, but many of them would presume that our way of doing things are wrong and that we got the wrong end of the stick instead of understanding that the you know, different disciplines and different groups do things in different ways. And sometimes things are just different and not wrong if they don't comply with you know, the way that you're used to doing things. Specifically, I think there's also the open-endedness of research in other contexts and understanding that not knowing and doing research in a curious, iterative, open-ended way is not um, a sloppy or lazy approach, but is a legitimate way of knowing and um, very important work quite often. Also, there's the discrepancy between form and function, the tension between form and function, and the acknowledgement that um, research can be of a high academic and ethical standard despite informality and lower levels of documentation. If research is complicated, open-ended, and if there is a lot of iteration, then often extensive documentation don't make sense in the early stages of the research. Then this is my last slide. I think reflecting on my experience with, with um, uh, uh, HREC and REC committees over the years, I think what is very problematic and which is no, not a fault of any of these committees is that we operate on a heritage, um, you know, from uh, developed countries and sort of a very medical way of looking at life. Um, and um, the process originated from sort of vast and very serious and severe um, uh, your yeah, um, violations of of trust of the research participants, uh, which is not at all the type of risk which is average or typical uh, for the projects that are now assessed using this method. Um, and I think the fact that it also comes from an environment where one has a medical lens on the patient or the the respondent can be very problematic and, and limiting um, for research activity. I think most important for us perhaps is the developed country context um, and the, the fact that um, it comes from a context where there are resources, stability, and a lot is known. Um, I've read, for instance, in preparing for this, I've read about um, a student at LSE who fought very hard to get verbal consent um, uh, approved by a university because she was working um, with a remote um, village where um, there's a lot of suspicion, partly due to how things were done in the past. There were a huge level of suspicion about written consent. And we also sometimes um, have that in our own studies, not as frequent, but sometimes. And I think the last point to make in terms of the origins of this process and this 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 um, um, ethical permission process is that originally it was conceived as happening within one discipline and now it's happening across disciplines and one of the most painful and difficult parts of this is often the assessment of benefit across different disciplines and I think it it can create a lot of distrust and a lot of um, uh, yeah it can create a lot of um, I've seen amongst my PhD students um, you know that it, at it creates harm um, in their assessment of their own work and, and in their confidence in their own work. And um, I think that is 
a, a massive risk and um, one needs to consider that. Then just generally, as economists, um, I want to just say that they, we often think that there are about three, there are three important approaches to regulation, and the best is often a mixture of a, approaches. So the first is the command and control, and I don't mean to, that's quite sort of like a negative name for it, um, but, you know, that doesn't necessarily, you know, reflect my own position. Then there's performance-based or SOPs. The, the difficulty with SOPs is it, it can work well, but there can be problems with cheating and there's only one set of rules and it might, for instance, um, be um, biased towards the small guys. And then the third option is management-based or self-guided regulation. And that the po positive about that is it's more flexible and dynamic, provo promotes innovation and mutual learning. And also, for me, one of the positives of of that is that it that because you need to set your own standards and develop your own guidance, it ensures that there's ownership of these techniques and that uh, the of these approaches. And that is versus command and control, which is very effective but comes at a high cost and often stifles innovation. And I think, um, yeah, it's about getting the mix right um, for the specific environment. I just want to end by. By based on my own experience, documenting which I th the things that I think are the biggest risk, and I've spoken to quite a few people, so I think these are general general experiences. Firstly, I think there is a risk of a breakdown of trust and credibility within the institution. Um, I think there is a substantial risk of um, these processes having an impact on the self esteem of young researchers. I mean, and often that's not necessarily due to um, what is said, but how it is said, and the, you know, a tone of um, condescension, tone of um, outrage almost, um, which is not necessary. And I know the job of the ATREC and the REC is incredibly difficult, and I have a great deal of respect. And in general, I have mostly positive experiences. Um, but I think it is important to, to note this because um, it can crush young young researchers the way that the feedback is given. Then uh, thirdly and, and lastly, um, I think it's vital that the researcher remains a responsible entity. There's a real risk that um, if the ATREC and the RECs are seen as policing um, uh, ethics that, that we implicitly transfer the responsibility to, to them and that would not have the intended consequences that we would want. Um, and then I think lastly, um, it's vital for me that um, we remain supportive and flexible towards research that exploratory, open-ended and iterative, because I think that's exactly the type of research that in developing countries we need to be doing more of um, to understand vulnerability and to understand um, social justice, to promote social justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Berger, for very interesting, um, not only the study, but these reflections at the end. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we are just about on the hour. Um, to Dr. Harinath, if I could please hand over to you, and then we will take questions from everyone at the end. So, um, to you, Graham. Hi, Graham. I see your comment in the chat. I'm just looking for your name and then I'll quickly fix that for you. Sorry about that. Camera and then you should be able to share and unmute your mic now. Hello, everyone. Apologies for the slight delay. If you can all hear me. Hi. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to. Sorry. No, every, I was just confirming everything showing Graham. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Bronwyn. Um, OK, perfect. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today. Um, I'm going to offer some reflections um, on nesting norms and needs uh, to follow on from Ranel's excellent talk. Um, I must situate that in a kind of background to my working context. I'm going to give some thoughts on gaps 
between health and social science. I'm going to present some case examples of work that I've involved in in no detail, um, and these are only to stimulate thinking. Um, please don't tell me that I've transgressed some, somewhere. No, do if, if I have, <laughs> and we will correct. Uh, and then some concluding thoughts. Um, so the first thing to say is that I'm a social scientist, uh, according to the HBCSA, a psychologist in independent practice research, which is a um, slightly odd category. There aren't that many of us. Um, but I work completely uh, in the Department of Pediatrics um, on the uh, medical campus uh, and have done since 2012. And so I'm a social scientist and most of my colleagues uh, in my direct environment are uh, medical doctors first and then uh, kind of clinician researchers or epidemiologists uh, and similar. I also have the privilege of very recently becoming part of a wider network. Um, so the National Institutes of Health in the US fund a clinical trials network called IMPACT. Um, where and where I work at on campus uh, at Stellenbosch is um, a clinical trials unit for that network. And they've recently decided in this network, which is um, for clinical trials, principally, you know, safety evaluations of new drugs or, um, you know, efficacy evaluations of, of therapies, these sorts of things, um, that they actually need a social behavioral core um, and have been nominated to be a site representative. So there's six of us from around the world uh, involved who are supposedly giving advice on how to do social behavioral science nested in clinical trials. Um, and so I think that what that means is I'm a social behavioral, I'm doing social behavioral science in health and not uh, as some colleagues perhaps um, on main campus, which is really studying of health or alongside health. I've really become part of the machine. So take everything I say with that pinch of salt. Um, so the first thing to say in terms of gaps between health and social science, uh, I think that any gaps are really closing um, because there is an acknowledged increasing multidisciplinarity. That's what I see. And the second caveat is I don't really think any of the gaps are fundamental, but rather rather things that are lost in translation. So with that said, potentially there could be gaps in how social science or social and behavioral science is done um, and how health research is typically done across three categories. Um, firstly, why the research is being done, and that translates into your aim or your question and your design. And actually across disciplines and fields, we tend to um, use different terms for often the same thing. Um, my experience has been, and, and this may not be true, but my experience has been that in social behavioral sciences, we often insist on people having a question. Um, and it must end with a question mark somewhere at the beginning of, of their protocol or their proposal. Um, whereas in health studies or in trials, um, often you, what you get is a, a principal research aim um, and then set of objectives and no question. But obviously your aim essentially is a question, but with a full stop. So why we think we're doing the, the research can result in some loss in translation. And similarly, what the research is how it's organized the design how we describe the design um, that may lead to some thinking around epistemology but for example on the atrix submission you can you can click descriptive as your design um, or qualitative as your design i think at last check um, and have no specificity within that um, what exactly it is that you're doing whereas in the social behavioral sciences actually you've got to go into much more detail because design is more nuanced so there are these losses in translation there and then a big one is, of course, how the research is actually done or your methods. So thinking about those, the three categories where there may be um, gaps, I did some reflecting on, on some projects that I've been worked on, and I thought, what do we do with research which is nested? So I'll give an example. This is the first study example. Um, it's a TB or tuberculosis trials consortium, which is linked to the Centers for Disease Control in the US. And they're doing their study 35. Um, which is a trial um, evaluating uh, a regimen called 3HP um, for tuberculosis preventive therapy in children. So the standard regimen at the moment, if you want to use um, tuberculosis treatment prophylax uh, as prophylaxis, uh, you go on to a six month once a day. 
there's already been a study which showed that actually you can take an alternative formulation uh, of two drugs uh, called 3HP, uh, which is isoniazid plus rifapentine. And you can, instead of taking that treatment for six months once a day, you can actually take it for three months once a week. And, you, and it works just as well to prevent you developing TB disease. That has been shown in adults. It hasn't been shown in children. This is the trial evaluating whether it works in children. And it's being done at a multi-site, multi-country, and it's essentially uh, doing a safety and efficacy evaluation. So is it safe to do this and does it work? Um, within that, we've nested some acceptability. We want to know what are the people who are actually receiving this once weekly regimen, which is different from uh, current standard of care. How do they experience that regimen? Um, and because of various things, including funding, including the sponsor not wanting to um, com complicate their trial, which is answering a very important medical question, we got permission and budget to do this evaluation at a single site, our site, in a purpose of subsample of the participants. And with those participants, we interview them in depth. We conduct social science research, essentially, um, multiple times to understand their experiences. And in this case, the way that this collaboration between social science and health research is happening is that the nesting is happening where you have a separate protocol for the acceptability component. So the, the trial protocol was already reviewed and approved, and we wrote a separate protocol which was only for um, the acceptability evaluation. And that was reviewed by ATRIC, and there was an ancillary study budget, but it's a separate budget from the um, from the parent trial. Um, so that's one model of how social science can be nested in, in health research. An alternative, it's another study, it's called Catalyst. Um, many uh, This will be a recurring theme. <laughs> many tuberculosis treatments for children um, are very poorly pal palatable. They're very difficult to dose because they're not, um, they don't dissolve easily. They don't create suspensions. They don't, aren't scored. The dosing is really complicated. So with colleagues um, in the parent trial, they actually worked with manufacturers to develop two um, novel formulations, so new formulations, uh, which are just it's the same drug, but just made differently so that you um, they are they are not dissolvable. They do create suspenses. They're much easier to put into a little bit of water and then give to a, a small child. And in this Catalyst trial, uh, they're doing a multi-site, multi-country safety and efficacy evaluation similar to the study 35, which I just mentioned, to work out um, does the new formulation work as well as the existing formulation? Is it safe and does it work as well? But critically, they also put into the trial protocol and acceptability. So safety, efficacy and acceptability. So the acceptability that has been nested, we do exactly the same thing. We want to understand the children and their caregivers experiences of these novel formulations. We're working in all of the sites with the purpose of subsample. We also do multiple serial in-depth interviews with lots of participatory activities to really understand their experiences. And in this case, the work has been nested where it was one protocol and the acceptability is written as a secondary objective alongside uh, the other components. And instead of having a separate budget, we have ring fenced line items in the parent trial budget. But those are two ways in which you can do social science in health research, um, which I think have implications for, um, you know, what, <laughs> how we should be doing this research and, and how we think about the research and how the protocol is evaluated and who reviews it and so on. So first of all, if you have two separate protocols, there is an additional admin burden for the RECs. Um, but on the other hand, if you have one protocol and you want to do something small, like, you know, you've said you're going to sample uh, to saturation in the nested acceptability work, and you expect to have approximately, say, 10 participants or 12 participants, and you end up not really reaching saturation, and you're getting closer to 20, and you feel like you need to make that change and, and tell the rec about that, that means an actual full amendment of the whole protocol, not your separate um, protocol, um, which can lead to lots of delays and additional uh, work. So, uh, yeah. All right. We've just lost those slides for a second there. Um, okay. So we're not see we're not seeing Graham's slides. I think there are other slides being shared by um, <laughs> okay by Anita. Um, have I overridden and, that? And we're back. Yes. <laughs> so I'm you, not quite sure where we got to, but sorry. Apologies, everyone. Um, so the other thing is. Uh, 
funder or sponsor input. So, so for example, in the study 35, um, often the people who are funding the clinical trial, the, the overall health research, have very little understanding of social and behavioral science um, and will require you to fill out forms which don't make much sense and so on. And so one way to escape that is if you say, well, I'll do it as a separate nested study, but an ancillary study, which will have its own protocol, and then they go, okay, it doesn't interfere with my the main point, uh, and they kind of let you get on with it. But I just think for a point of um, reflection, the first thing that I wanted to raise was, how do we actually do social science in health research when there are these sorts of dynamics? And I present those two examples um, as, as one way of thinking about it. Um, the next uh, thing, so I've got three things that I'm hoping we can talk about, is just norms that are quite different between social uh, and behavioral science and health science or health research. So the third example is a project uh, called Dimple, which Bronwyn knows quite well since we co-supervised the, the nested master's student. Um, this is a, a project which is about distress uh, associated with being hospitalized for TB care, drug resistant TB care as a child. So some children who have drug resistant TB end up in hospital for multiple months, sometimes six, sometimes nine, sometimes even longer than that. And often they're quite young children, um, which social scientists would immediately go, well, what does that do for your relationship with your families? And often they can't be visited by families and they, you know, what your, your developmental changes and these sorts of things. This project is very much a pragmatic participatory co-development of intervention materials with um, our colleagues who work uh, at the hospital, who are the nurses, the, the teachers, the educators, the hospital management, where we're, we're saying, well, these children are here. Um, how can we do better to help minimize the negative experience of being uh, in hospital? And then we have a nested uh, MA uh, in psych uh, that is evaluating the actual tools that we're developing. Um, a similar study, uh, where we're really interested in uh, caregivers' experiences uh, of administering one of the TB treatment drugs, the drug-resistant TB uh, drugs called clofazamine. Um, so there, again, there's a novel formulation of this clofazamine. Um, the standard formulation of clofazamine comes as a gel capsule uh, in 100 microgram. And for young children, that's too high a dose. So you actually have to give half of a gel capsule. So uh, this is not a pill, this is a thing that you have to cut and then it, all the liquid comes out. So you can administer, um, imagine that's incredibly difficult to do um, as a caregiver. So they've come up with a smaller gel capsule, which they can hopefully just swallow. Um, and we're doing nested serial inter interviews about the acceptability of this. And then we've got a nested um, MA, uh, which is thinking about the caregiver's experiences. Now, there's a norm in the social and behavioral sciences, and for both of these students, just to pick up on a point Renelle uh, raised earlier about early career researchers, there's a norm in the social sciences, and both of these are students doing MAs in psych, that you have to have a, co a conceptual framework, that you have to make uh, some kind of links to or draw on social theory, where the work that they're doing at a pragmatic level is actually quite simple. It's like, what do, they, what do the caregivers think of how they have to administer this novel formulation of the old formulation which they had to cut and then somehow get the gel into a teaspoon or a syringe what do they think of that um, at, when it is reviewed by health colleagues uh, or even by the atrec the expectation that you have to have a complex conceptual framework or draw in uh, social theory is relatively minimal because the health people just go okay they they want to know what this new version tastes like or um, how we can do better for these uh, children in the hospital. But the expectation and the norm in the social behavioral sciences is that you really have to think through those things. And that disjuncture can cause some confusion. So that's one direction. It's just one example of how differences in norms might um, complicate things. Um, another, uh, maybe the other way around, in clinical trials, you are required to report adverse events even if that uh, event is unrelated to the intervention. So, you know, you, your participants may be on a drug trial and they may have some other medical condition which is known to be not related or they may be in a car accident, clearly not related, uh, but it still has to be documented and reported. And actually, the sites uh, who are running these uh, evaluations are, are themselves evaluated through quite intensive monitoring. And if you have many adverse events, you are less competitive to receive additional project funding. That is the reality. And even if you have just an adverse event, 
Um, that could lead to the study being paused, many delays in the in the projects happening, um, and the valuable research uh, not not proceeding. Now, if you do any of the nested studies mentioned above, where you're describing people's experiences and you're doing lots of serial in-depth interviews and peeling back the layers of people's experiences and getting to know them over time in their homes and the complicated lives that they lead. We all live complicated lives. Um, Five minutes. Thank you. Um, you're you're going to see things which are adverse, right? Just to take a hypothetical example, um, a trial participant might say to the nurse, yes, I'm taking the drugs and I'm giving the drugs to my child as requested, but then you really get to know them and they feel more comfortable and they start telling you, well, they're not actually giving the drug. And that's reportable. So what do we do with this norm? It actually disincentivizes nesting search and behavioral research where it's really important to understand the patient's experiences or the caregiver's experiences, but you risk um, big challenges to actually conducting the research. Um, so what do we do? Do we have different rules for different types of studies? Um, I think there's a lot of currently lack of capacity or knowledge across the system, so people in health don't really understand the norms of social behavioral research and, and vice versa. And how does sanity prevail in, in these sorts of systems? Like surely not everything that a person tells you in an in-depth interview about their lives becomes an adverse event, but there may be an expectation from some people that it is. The last uh, third uh, thing is, is around the participants' needs and how to address those and that they may actually be different. The, the study I'm presenting here is, is called Chillpref ML. So we know that many drug resistant TB drugs taste awful and they have really poor acceptability for children. So what we did was a swish and, piss, swish and spit taste panel evaluation. There is a video on it if you want to click on that link. So essentially what we did is we got manufacturers to actually come up with new formulations that were flavored differently. Um, and we asked children to take that into the mouth, like a wine tasting, spit it out, and then tell us which ones they preferred. And that will now inform which of those formulations are actually taken to market and used across the world. So there's lots of complexity to conducting this research. But I think the truth is in this, this is an example of children need to be included in that research. If we use adults um, taste preferences to determine which drugs are put to market, um, we end up with drugs which don't taste very nice for children because children prefer different things to adults. Um, and so children in this example, but also other people are often excluded from research. Um, and at the same time, you have to balance including them, finding ways of including them with uh, the complexity of doing so. So there's this increasing policy level push uh, to value, local social value. So the experiences and preferences of, of, of people, but how to do so and how to do so in a way which is inclusive, which addresses the needs of the people who are actually gonna be served for the, by the, the new Whatever it, whatever it is, the new therapy, the new regimen, the new formulation, uh, the new health innovation um, goes against uh, norms. And so I think it's just the third thing that I want to say is really think about the needs of the end um, users and the populations who are going to need these products. So then what is re appropriate regulatory oversight? So these new formulations that we came up with uh, in our instance, we spoke to SAPRA and, and realized that these are not new medical devices. They're not ingesting them, they're spitting them out. So therefore, this was classified as only social behavioral research and therefore low risk and therefore uh, could carry on. But we also get this uh, sort of dualism coming up where um, we put a lot of work in the social behavioral research and really thinking about the risks of being interviewed and the possibility that you might, being interviewed might raise some deep-seated uh, angst or complexity in your life and that may, may make you upset. And on the other hand, in many cases, these same participants are getting an experimental drug. And those two things seem not anywhere near on par when you put them so boldly next to each other. And so how we think about that uh, can be complex and the and wrecks in the humanities and wrecks in the health often think quite differently about those two things, uh, where doing interviews can often just be okay, that's fine, because you're not giving them an experimental drug. Um, and similarly, appropriate reimbursement for participation. So if you're a clinical trial participant, uh, you, your tie is um, mandated by SAPRA, I think it's 500 Rand or something like that. Um, whereas if you're just being interviewed in your home and the person's come to you, maybe that's not right. And again, there can often be confusion about these. 
So those are my three things. Um, nesting work, norms that are different, and then thinking really about the needs of our, our participants. So in concluding thoughts, I think there are many opportunities rather than gaps. Um, I think capitalizing those opportunities really require much greater clarity of purpose of why the research is being done and, and that is different. Um, I think there also needs to be higher quality and I can say this as a social scientist, I think um, particularly in how social science research is um, regulated, thought about um, and, and what the quality standards are so that those can be communicated better. I see far too many, you know, I interviewed eight people, asked them what their opinion was and this is their opinion type research with no analysis reported as kind of a fine and that doesn't seem like social science to me. Um, I think finding ways of having diversity on the rec so that you can have appropriate review, but that is really complicated to do. And then I think much greater engagement between the researchers who are, I'm going to say, assume are trying to do their best, but don't know how to do their best and, and flexibility and talking with them as best we can. Linked to that, I really think we can't stress enough the importance of community participation and engagement. This is a tenet that has been widely adopted in health research and is more difficult to fund if you're doing purely social behavioral research, but certainly capitalizing on um, platforms when you can engage with communities who are in various ways affected, you know, the people who will benefit from the search uh, if it's done appropriately and all throughout the process. And then lastly, I just want to say, I think the principles hold throughout, but I think in practice, there are quite a few potential gaps we might fall into. Thank you. Thank you very much, Graham, um, for uh, an insightful talk and um, some incredible work that you're doing. I've seen the video of the of the tasting um, trial that you're running, and um, it's fascinating to to see um, young people being so engaged in, in relations that are being developed for them. So that together with all of the other work and your reflections have been um, have been so important. Um, colleagues, from what I can see is that um, there are some comments made mostly to both uh, Graham and Renal. Um, Renal, I see that you have um, been responding to some of the comments addressed to you in the chat. So I don't see anything that's necessarily unresolved at this point. So perhaps um, before checking in on the comments again, um, I could ask if there are members on the call who would like to um, would like to pose a question if you could raise your hand um, and then Carissa Wade and can can help to unmute your microphone camera any comments for our two speakers from from when I actually um just responded to Lynn's question because we had some discussion about how the REC has dealt with COVID research protocols um Lynn if you want to comment I activated your microphone and your camera Thanks, Clarissa. Hi, thanks. Um, thanks, Clarissa. And thanks, everyone, Renal and Graham, for a really an excellent um, session. Um, yeah, I think researchers sometimes, particularly working in the social sciences, can often see um, research ethics committees, especially those that are following, you know, more a traditional um, way of doing things, which in, certainly at my institution, we often get accused of a biomedicalization of research ethics. And so they can really see see us as as a stumbling block and a roadblock. And I think the 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 presentation by Renal really gave an example of what was ethically very challenging research, but had the huge potential for massive benefit. And how if 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 an ethics committee is willing to work, you know, and 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 have, engage in these discussions um, with re, with the, the 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 research team, how you can often find a way forward. And um, certainly there is a role for for research involving deception, and and there's a lot of ethical issues. There is some guidance, obviously, um, but you 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 have to have on a case by case basis these in-depth discussions is how best to mitigate the, the risk, whether you need to have a debriefing um, afterwards and uh, these kinds of things. So I, 
I can't um, remember the details of Renell's study. It was a long time ago. Um, but, you know, I think it, it was a, a, such a good example to bring here. And, and then obviously the work that Graham is doing as well. But I wanted to just pose the question um, perhaps to the broader audience in terms of certainly many, many ethics committees that are reviewing social and behavioral educational research do work according to the NREC guidelines, but certainly at my institution, many, some of our faculty ethics committees don't. They deliberately feel that there's a, that this is um, not entirely suitable for social science um, type research. And whereas I have always felt that the Emmanuel 8 benchmarks um, have always worked for me when I've been reviewing research, is it time that we need alternative an alternative framework for social science research? So I don't have the answer to that question, but you know, if anyone has has views or if our two presenters have views, I'd be very um, happy to hear them. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Professor Horn. Um, Graham or Renell, do you have any views that you'd like to share, or is there someone else on the on the call who would like to share some views? Yes, Graham. Um, I never shy to have a view. Um, Hylan, I worry. Um, you know, again with the caveat that I am a trained in social science and making a career in health science, essentially. But I worry just as a social scientist that we are too ready to try and set different goalposts for ourselves. When I think, you know, just using the priority, so this is around research ethics, but I think just the principles of research, I think too often we give ourselves um, freedom to do whatever we want <laughs> and set different standards for ourselves. Um, where, you know, which actually aren't that rigorous. And I think it's compounded by the fact that the social sciences, the social and behavioral sciences are so diverse. Uh, the traditions are so diverse. It isn't, uh, you know, a single um, congregation really, uh, to put it that way. I would say that research is like ethical, research is good, regardless of the discipline trying to do it. And I think the whole point of principles, research ethics principles, is that they should um, they should be universally applied. It may take more work to work out how they should be applied, but I don't think that uh, setting different practices or norms is uh, workable or appropriate, in my opinion. Thank you, Graham. Um, Renal, would you like to? to offer any thoughts on this? Um, yes, sure. I mean, I have some thoughts um, that I think at least can guide us into interesting discussions. And um, the first is that I think um, in certain instances where one is dealing with work that's quite open ended and not very high risk, one should start to think about different ways of doing the ethic guidance, ethical guidance. And I think, I mean, I've often wondered whether it won't be possible to have uh, conversations and um, check-ins uh, constitute a bigger part of the oversight in such um, instances, um, you know, rather than um, sort of a formal and a paper-based process being the main vehicle. I think there should still be some documentation, but maybe, you know, something that's a little bit more flexible, but definitely has, um, you know, the objectivity um, and the third party oversight that um, the ethical process brings us. And, you know, I think it is about just discussions and opening it up and thinking what's appropriate and what's legal. Um, and because I think the important thing is um, to try and think how we can up our standards, but without it stifling research, without it incurring such large emotional <laughs> in terms of our research students, but also sort of waiting time and, and money costs in instances where the risk is quite low. And I, I mean, I don't have answers and I have a huge respect for the investments the university and, um, you know, the reviewers are making. I also think that given um, the implicit cost of um, ethics to researchers, you know, in terms of 
waiting times and publications foregone, it probably makes sense for most universities to throw more money at the ethics committees um, to make it reimbursed work that um, is sort of, uh, you know, um, counts towards career promotion um, to have um, budgets for getting advisors in where outside advice is necessary to, um, you know, get a get a good perspective on the benefits and the costs and the risks of a, of a specific study. I mean, those are just some ideas that I have because I think the work um, is re really very demanding. And I think I have a great respect for the key and the uh, rigor uh, and the dedication with which the committees are doing the work. But it is it has just become larger and bigger and more demanding. Um, and it's very it's work where you are in a conflict position because always the researchers want things to go faster and they want approval. So I think it, it bears a big toll on the committee and on those managing the process. Um, and because it has such a huge impact on all of the researchers' lives, I think if there are ways to use university resources to smooth uh, the system and make things run better, I'm almost, as an economist, <laughs> my opinion that is that it would definitely be uh, efficiency promoting to to expand resources um, and with that maybe also think about to what extent one can have more flexibility and there could be different ways of doing things um, without compromising rigor and um, standards thanks thank you very much Renal. Len, i'm sure you'll have quite a few things to say yeah. Uh, I, <laughs> thank you, thank you, Bronwyn. Uh, I just um, I made a comment in the in the chat, and I I was just thinking, you know, perhaps for for the sake of the colleagues um, that are at um, uh, 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 institutions where they don't have a faculty of health or the or a or a department of health or or, or something like that, whether um, Clarissa or Blanche could just you know um, uh, just quickly explain how it works. Um, you know, it's uh, at, at our university where we have you know where where it's sometimes is a case that. That you can't um, choose either to submit at the one uh, committee or the other one and we, 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 we have joint committees there's a rumor going around uh, you know that it's easier to get past the, the humanities wreck than the health wreck you know so um, perhaps uh, uh, you can just uh, uh, comment something on this you know how, how these joint uh, um, reviews work and you know the, the feedback process um, on, on these reviews. Clarissa Blount, would you like to go ahead? And then I think we, we have about two minutes or so. Yeah. I'm just going to activate uh, Prof Blanche's camera and our microphone, but I can start with the, with the joint review process. It's just that we've started collaborating more on where we, if we see that there is a, a research project that might be um, in this case, like in, in Graham and in Ronald's case, we might um, my role then as the, um, I would check in with Prof Blanche to find out, is there perhaps um, an opportunity for a joint review? And that joint review process would usually involve just um, the, uh, making a decision on where the, which would be the primary rec that would review the application, and then recruiting a reviewer from the, the other committee, either if, it's, if the primary review is taking place at HREC, HREC would ask for one of our social science reviewers to do a co-review of the application or vice versa, where we would often have someone from the Health Research Ethics Committee play a role as a co-expert reviewer on the application. And then the primary review committee would be responsible of sharing those comments and feedback with the researcher and, of course, then processing the, any responses that flow from that engagement. Um, that in a nutshell is how we've started managing joint reviews between a social science research ethics committee and a health research ethics committee. But of course, um, Prof Blanche will probably say we still need to set up an SOP in that regard. Yeah, if I can just say from uh, the HREC uh, point of view, I think what is not helpful in in terms of managing ethics submissions is this quite loose reference in the guidelines from the Department of Health around what constitutes health research. 
So from a pragmatic point of view, it's been necessary for us to actually cooperate on reviews rather than sending researchers who have submitted on probably the different uh, uh, REC's uh, platform. So for me, the collaboration is number one, a pragmatic one. The second one is the very real definitional of uh, issues around what constitutes health research. And then thirdly is just also saying that we can never represent all levels of disciplinary expertise on a single committee. And so collaboration for me becomes a very important vehicle for not frustrating our researchers as well, because at the end of the day, the ethics committee is looking at a layer of peer review. And I, th I think what for me is very strong in what uh, our two speakers have actually said today is that that kind of dialogue, because of the workloads of, of RECs, and I'm not talking only from an HREC at, at Stephen Bosch, uh, perspective, but on every single REC that I've ever served on in my career, that has been a fundamental issue is that there isn't always the time and the space to actually engage each other. And that has a knock on effect to the kind of feedback that is then consumed in a, a, a particular way, but also given in a particular way. So I'm going to stop there. Thanks. Thanks very much, um, uh, Prof. Pretorius. Um, so, colleagues, this brings us then to the end of this session. I see the next one is due to start at um, 22. Um, Clarissa, is there a time adjustment there now? I'm wondering if Prof. Anita and Prof. Teresa are online. I was just asking whether we could perhaps start at 11.50, um, 10 minutes to 12. Um, just so that we can give everyone a 10 minute break. Would that be in order? Um, that will be fine. It's Anita speaking. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. So, everyone, we will be back at 10 to 12. I'll just post it in the chat for everyone to see um, for our next session. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to our speakers. Bye.